Hello, my name is Mario Malfavon. This is the Armstrong Research Group Lab at the University of Arizona Chemistry Department. And today we'll be walking you through a cadmium selenide nanoparticle synthesis. Okay, so this is a sample of finished nanoparticles of three various sizes. You can see under room light, they're uh, very close in color, but as we illuminate with a UV lamp, uh, you can see the effect of quantum confinement and uh, you have a change in emission color based on size. So the appeal of using these nanoparticles either in photovoltaics or uh, especially for us in LEDs is the fact that they have a very narrow emission. So you end up with uh, LEDs that have very pure light. Uh, they also have, again, a size tunable emission. So once you can solution process one, you can change the color of your LED uh, without changing your processing options. So because some of the components of the synthesis are air sensitive, we use Schlenk technique to keep all of our materials under argon uh, during the synthesis. We have a Schlenk line here which has uh, on one side a vacuum port, uh, on the other we have a argon line. So what we can do is under the same line, pull vacuum on our system, uh, dry it down completely, backfill it with argon, and now work under an atmosphere. Now, while you have a slight positive pressure of argon, you can uh, remove septa of your sealed system and add any components, uh, in our case, our cadmium oxide and our oleic acid, uh, and then seal it up without fear of, of contaminating your system with air. Um, on the other side, we have a thermocouple to monitor temperature of our solution, and we're using a heating mantle to provide heat in this case, which is uh, running through a temperature control box. So the first two components we add are uh, cad oxide and oleic acid, which we then heat to 200 degrees uh, in a non-coordinating solvent, which is octadecene, uh, and that allows reaction to form cadmium oleate, which is our cadmium precursor. Okay, so in a similar fashion as we did with the cadmium precursors, we also have to do the uh, selenium precursor mixtures in an inert atmosphere. Uh, in this case, we use a glove box, which is under nitrogen. Uh, the components we add here are selenium metal. Having teared your vial, uh, you can add selenium. Uh, in this case, it's in powder form. And we combine that with a tributyl phosphine, uh, the phosphine being a reducing agent, which then reduces selenium, uh, making it reactive. And the phosphine is the preliminary reason we work in a glove box, um, as it is pyrophoric. We do keep our solution in the glove box until prior to use, and then keep it under uh, argon by covering it with a septa until we inject it. So when you initially add the phosphines, um, you can see the selenium in there and actually warms up a bit. You can feel it through the gloves and you shake this until you end up with a clear solution and all your selenium is reduced. And you shake until it's clear and there's no trace of the metal left. So once you have a clear cadmium oleate solution, uh, you bring that back down to room temperature and you start adding your ligands. Uh, in this case, we'll be using a trioctyl phosphine oxide and octadecylamine. And again, you can remove the septa as long as you're under a slight partial positive argon pressure. The second component we add is the amine. Uh, we use a ratio of topo to octadecylamine of three to one.
So once you have both component, components in the system, uh, we'll be increasing our temperature to injection temperature, which in this case will be 280 degrees Celsius. So as our cadmium precursor solution uh, increases to injection temperature, we are going to transfer our selenium precursor solution over to our hood. So we're just going to uh, refill our antechamber with the uh, argon so we can transfer our vial over. So as we prepare to inject our selenium precursor solution that we've brought out of the glove box, uh, we first have to backfill with argon to ensure that we don't expose this to air. So using positive argon line, we start supplying inert gas and using a very large bore needle uh, so that we're able to do a quick injection. Uh, we pump purge initially. So what you want to do is slowly withdraw some of the inert atmosphere from your vial. And you purge it out. And you do this motion three times and that should withdraw or remove any moisture that might be in your needle since we are dealing with moisture sensitive materials. Once you've purged your needle, you can then withdraw your selenium precursor solution. And you're ready to inject. And once you're ready to inject, We've reached injection temperature. You quickly inject. And you allow it to grow for whatever length of time uh, you've decided for your particles. In this case, we'll be growing for two minutes. And we're going to shift our growth temperature. Uh, we're setting that to 260 degrees. Okay, so once we've grown for two minutes, we're going to assist the cooling down just by blowing compressed lab air over our round bottom flask. So we remove our heating mantle. Okay, so once you reach about 100 degrees, you can stop cooling. Just let that cool naturally back down. Uh, once that reaches about 60 or 70 degrees, we can start the purification process. Okay, so once your reactions cool down to about 60 degrees, uh, we can get ready to transfer it over to centrifuge tubes for cleaning. So what we'll be doing is transferring the contents of our round bottom flask to two separate centrifuge tubes. Now we're going to add a small amount of chloroform to each vial. to help with solubility. And now we're adding a non-solvent to cause our nanoparticles to crash out. So the trick here is to add enough to crash them out, but just enough. Uh, if you add too much, then you'll also crash out an excess of your ligand. 
And the way you tell where you have vetted enough is you'll see a color change. You go from a clear solution to something more opaque. As you can see there. Now, as you add your non-solvent, you'll see some scattering. Your solution starts to become colored. If you shake it up, sometimes it'll go back to a clear solution. Uh, this has stayed relatively colored, so we know we've added enough non-solvent. So we repeat the process with the other vial. You can see in this case, we've added some non-solvent. As we mix this up, we go back to a clear, or a, yes, a clear solution. So we know we need more non-solvent. So now we'll take these vials over to the centrifuge and spin them down at 5,000 RPM for five minutes. So if you're careful, your tubes are already balanced. If not, you need to balance them before spinning. Uh, and again, we'll be spinning at 5,000 RPM for five minutes. Ready? So after five minutes, what you have is a relatively dark pellet and a still colored a turbid solution, which should be uh, mostly excess ligand with some nanoparticles that didn't crash out. So now we'll go decant off our supernatant and redissolve our pellets and then um, acetone and reprecipitate them. All right, so having centrifuge these, we have a dark pellet and a turbid supernatant, which should have a good amount of excess ligand in it. So what we do is decant off our supernatant. And we redissolve this pellet using a chloroform as a solvent, as earlier. And you want to use just a minimum, minimum amount of chloroform. So as you're dissolving your pellets, uh, occasionally they don't cooperate, they're not as soluble. Uh, what you can do is use a vortex to aid in getting them back into solution. Okay. And now to your, to your solvated particles, you add non-solvent, which again, in this case, we're using acetone. Until you have a colored turbid solution and that turbidity stays. Okay, so now we'll centrifuge these again at 5,000 for five minutes. So this is a uh, one inch square glass substrate that's coated with indium tin oxide, our uh, transparent conducting oxide. Uh, we've etched out a hourglass pattern and we're getting ready to spin coat our P-dot and polymer layer. We'll go ahead and set our substrate on our spin coater. Use the vacuum to hold it down. And we'll be depositing one layer of P-dot PSS. We have filtered P-dot PSS and we're adding just enough to cover the entire surface of your substrate. And so we do this at a spin rate of 3000 RPM and we deposit for one minute. So after one minute, we transfer the substrate to a 120 degree hot plate and heat for 10 minutes. So after annealing your P-dot layer for 10 minutes, we uh, replace our substrate onto our spin coater and we're ready to deposit our polymer nanocrystal blend. Uh, first thing we do is sonicate our blended solution for about 15 seconds to make sure we have good mixture. OK, 
Okay, so the next step is to deposit our organic layer. This is a blend of a polyfluorine, which is a blue emitting polymer, and CAD selenide nanocrystals. And this is a 30 weight percent solution of nanocrystals in polymer. And as you're depositing, you need to be cautious not to have any air bubbles on your surface. This way you have a uniform film. And we'll be spinning this at 2000 RPM for two minutes. So immediately after spin coating our polymer nanocrystal blend, we transfer our substrate to our boat. And we apply our mask for our aluminum top contact. And then we transfer the system to the vacuum chamber for aluminum deposition. This is our vacuum deposition chamber. And uh, we have a manipulator arm uh, which allows us to move our sample substrates uh, throughout our chamber as well as into a glove box. Uh, our first port uh, consists of an organic deposition section. Uh, we do have rough pumps as well as two turbo pumps uh, pulling on the chamber at any one time. We have uh, gate valves which can isolate our organic materials so we can work on other parts of the chamber while keeping our organic material under vacuum. Uh, we have a separate gate valve, which isolates uh, two separate organic deposition chambers. And finally, we have a metals deposition section where we put our top contacts onto our devices. So we have um, metal down in a crucible at the bottom of this chamber. And as we apply current, we heat this crucible up uh, under vacuum and start depositing metal. A uh, plume of metal will deposit up into this area where we have our boat and substrate. So after loading our substrate onto our boat, we can place our boat into the chamber onto these two prongs that are attached to a movable arm. And we can use this arm to transfer our substrates into position for deposition as well as into our glove box for testing. We now pull vacuum and once it's completely evacuated, we can start our aluminum deposition. Okay, so once we're ready to deposit, we reach a deposition rate of 0.3 angstroms per second and we slide our substrate into position and we deposit the first 20 nanometers at 0.3 angstroms per second to avoid damaging any organics. So after the first 20 nanometers of deposition, we can increase our deposition rate to about 1.4, 1.5 angstroms per second and complete the final 80 nanometers. But once our deposition is complete, we can withdraw our substrate. And now we just allow it to cool down. So once your deposition is complete, you vent your system with nitrogen and we can open up the gate valve. So once we open the gate valve to the glove box, we can transfer our sample into the glove box for testing. Well, after we've transferred our sample into the glove box, we can remove our LED from the boat and characterize. We can put our device into our testing rig. This allows us to test six separate devices. This is a lab view program that we've written to help us test our devices. And we do have uh, three different testing abilities here. Uh, what we'll be using today is this current and voltage characterization. We have the ability to do efficiency measurements and uh, luminance measurements as well, but we won't be doing that today. Uh, what this program allows us to do is to set a starting voltage, end voltage um, uh, increment that we'd like to measure at. 
as well as the time length frame we'd like to dwell, uh, current limits, and adjust the area in case we change our devices. Uh, we also have some parameters if we're making inorganic devices as well. Um, we can put our emitter, emitter data in as well as uh, other parameters we're looking for. But again, today we'll be focusing on the current and voltage characterization. Start testing, and this should be a typical current voltage curve for one of these devices. As we uh, increase potential, we see an increase in current. At some point, we reach a potential where we start injecting electrons into our device, uh, and we should see it light up. So one of the techniques we use in characterization is uh, scanning electron microscopy. So this is a field emission SEM, uh, which allows us to take images of our nanoparticles with uh, nanometer resolution. So aside from getting sizes from their absorption spectra, uh, we can actually physically see sizes of these nanoparticles uh, using this instrument. So this is an example of copper zinc tin sulfide nanoparticles, which are slightly larger than our CAD selenide, uh, roughly 20 to 30 nanometers.